Hey, welcome back everybody. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be talking about the brain. So continuing on with our exploration of the nervous system. So um, the human brain is a pretty complex thing. Um, so it's a, it's a much larger than most other uh, brains of other animals. So, um, and that's as a ratio of the size of the brain to the size of the body. So for the size of our human bodies, our human brains are really ridiculously big. Most of that, most of the increase in size that's happened over time has been um, an increase of, um, of the cerebrum. So, and especially of these frontal lobes up here. So the frontal lobes of the brain that kind of control a lot of our, um, our self-control, um, a lot of our ability to, to think through things and reason through problems, problem solving and abstract thought. So that some of those things are things that we are capable of that many other animals are not. Okay, so as far as the organization of the brain, we're gonna divide the brain into a few different pieces and parts here. So starting with the brainstem, uh, the brainstem is kind of a, an enlargement of the spinal cord. So as the spinal cord ascends up through the foramen magnum in the occipital bone, um, just as we get into um, the brain case, we hit the brainstem. So the brainstem uh, consists of three different parts. That's the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. All right, next we have the cerebellum. So cerebellum, again, is towards the back of your head here. Cerebellum is the second largest part of your brain. Um, that's gonna have control over some of your movements and coordination. Um, diencephalon is a the kind of deep inner portion of your brain. Um, diencephalon, we can subdivide into the thalamus, the hypothalamus. We'll talk about what those do in a minute. Uh, and then the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. It's also evolutionarily the newest part of the brain. Um, and uh, the most important for our kind of higher level complex thinking. Okay, so as far as uh, blood flow to the brain, we've mentioned this before in a, in a previous video, um, but just to kind of drive home the point of how much work the brain does. So uh, the, the amount of um, effort, energy it takes to keep your brain operating is a lot, right? So we need a lot of ATP to keep the brain going, which means we need a lot of glucose and oxygen to in order to generate that ATP. So we've got a lot of fresh blood supply going right to the brain. Um, so 20% uh, of the oxygen and glucose, even while your brain is just resting, goes directly to the brain uh, versus the 80% to the rest of your entire body. So brain uses a lot of energy. Um, so most of that blood is going to be supplied through the carotids and the vertebral arteries. So carotids are going to be on the side of your neck here vertebral arteries go up through the transverse foramina of your cervical vertebrae and enter the brain um, uh, through the back. Uh, and then as far as venous return, so return of the deoxygenated blood um, drains through the jugular veins. All right, so let's look at the brainstem. Uh, so again, this brainstem is this small part of the brain that we find um, at the base here. So down here would be the spinal cord, right? And then extending up from that, we've got the brainstem. And the brainstem has three major components to it, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain. So medulla oblongata is that first part right as it branches off the spinal cord. Next uh, up is the pons. So the pons, I always think, has a kind of rounded little pot belly on it. Um, so this sort of rounded portion lets you know you're looking at the pons here. Uh, and then just above that, we've got the midbrain. All right, so in general, a lot of important stuff is happening in the brainstem. So we'll start with the medulla oblongata. Um, medulla oblongata um, has uh, two bulges on the ventral side. So on the belly side of the medulla oblongata, there are two uh, bumps and we call those pyramids. Um, so these represent um, uh, motor tracks. So uh, they are tracks of axons that are heading out to control motor activity. Um, and they kind of cross over at a certain point uh, in the medulla oblongata. And where they cross over, we call that the decussation of the pyramids. So decussation just means that they're, they're crossing over from, uh, from one side to another. And this is why we say that the right side of your brain controls the left side of the body, because the motor signals from the, the right side of your brain are literally crossing over to control the left side of your body and, and vice versa for the left side of your brain to the right side of your body.
All right, so some important stuff that's going on in the medulla oblongata. Um, so the further back in the brain we go, so way down here in the brainstem, the more important the functional um, uh, activities here are for life itself. So um, we've got your cardiovascular center here. So a cardiovascular center is controlling the rate of your heartbeat. Um, it's controlling the force of your, your heartbeat, so how strong your heart's pumping. Um, we control some of the diameter of the blood vessels here, so that's helping us control the pressure of your blood. Um, so all that's controlled in the medulla oblongata. We've also got a respiratory center here. So respiratory center is going to control kind of the rate and rhythm of your breathing. Um, and then some basic um, kind of um, ejection responses here, like vomiting, coughing, and sneezing. So those are basic ejection reflexes that are in the medulla oblongata. All right, moving up a little bit. So as we were moving up in the brain a little bit higher, so just um, superior to the medulla oblongata is the pons. Um, the pons works with the medulla to help control breathing. So not, neither one on its own totally controls breathing. They kind of both work together. Um, so in the pons, we've got an area called the pontine respiratory group um, that normally kind of lays low and doesn't operate too much when you're just kind of doing normal quiet breathing. Um, but if you are, um, say, thinking about your breath or taking a big breath, um, on purpose or you're moderating your breathing when, say, you're talking, um, then you're going to swing in that uh, pontine respiratory group to help control some of that uh, more uh, thought out breathing. Okay. Um, we also kind of all along the surface of the brainstem, we've got this structure called the reticular formation. So the reticular formation is, is a whole bunch of these kind of cell bodies that sort of string themselves along um, the entire brainstem. Um, and a particular pathway in there is called the reticular activating system. So the reticular activating system is going to be important for things like consciousness. All right, so we need that reticular activating system um, to be active. When it's active, you're going to be awake. Um, when it's inactive, you go to sleep. So, so this is, it puts you in a state of um, sleep that you can still be waken up from or woken up from. So it's not like a, it's not like com being completely unconscious, it's just being asleep essentially. So reticular activating system is active when you're awake um, and goes inactive when you go to sleep. All right, so that, that was all in the brainstem. Um, now moving on to the next part of the brain that we're gonna talk about, which is the cerebellum. So cerebellum is, is right back here. Um, the cerebellum is gonna be important for um, movement, for muscle control, for especially for things like maintaining balance and posture. Um, your cerebellum is gonna be really important for that kind of thing. Even things like muscle memory, so the fact that you remember how to walk and you don't, you know, once you learn that when you're a tiny baby, you, you kind of don't forget it. Um, how to ride a bike, how to play piano, any kind of muscle memory things are probably um, controlled by the cerebellum. Okay, so here's a better picture just to point out. Um, so we've talked about the brainstem, which is this part here. We talked about the cerebellum, which is this part back here that looks kind of like a little piece of cauliflower. Now we're moving up into the diencephalon. So the diencephalon is colored um, like a pinkish orange color here in this picture. Um, diencephalon consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So all three of those structures are incorporated into the diencephalon, which is this kind of very deep part of your brain. All right, so let's talk about what the thalamus does. So the thalamus is the largest part of your diencephalon, and it basically acts as a relay station. So if we if we look at where the, the, the thalamus actually sits, right, the diencephalon is sitting kind of right on top of your brainstem, and your brainstem is sort of an extension of your spinal cord. So think of the thalamus as being kind of like a relay station where when signals are coming up through your spinal cord, they're, they're passing by the, the brainstem and they're landing in the thalamus. And the thalamus is gonna decide where to send that information to. So it acts as sort of like a router or a relay station. It's taking incoming information from the body and sending it to the correct places in the cerebral cortex. All right, so it's, it's all of this sensory information that's coming in from your body is gonna be processed by the, the thalamus.
All right, the epithalamus. Um, epithalamus is also sometimes, uh, well, it includes the pineal gland. So this is the sort of more posterior part of your diencephalon. It includes the pineal gland um, and also some structures called the habenular nu nuclei. Um, habenular nuclei mostly control things like reward and addiction. Um, but the, uh, the pineal gland is really important for maintaining your daily cycles. So uh, the fact that you wake up in the morning when the sun shines and you start to get sleepy at nighttime has to do with um, your circadian rhythm, which is controlled by the secretion of melatonin by your pineal gland. So pineal gland creates that hormone melatonin. Uh, and when melatonin is released, it causes you to get a little sleepy um, and, and go to sleep for the night. So this is kind of your biological clock, your internal daily rhythm. All right, and then the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus, this kind of little triangle structure right down here, colored in blue, light blue here. Um, so hypothalamus kind of hangs off the front of the, of the thalamus. Hypothalamus is gonna be incredibly important for maintaining homeostasis. So a lot of kind of basal homeostatic things are controlled by the hypothalamus. Um, it also serves as kind of a connection between your nervous system and your endocrine system. So your endocrine system is a system of hormones that also acts as a communication um, within your body. So where those two systems come together, the hypothalamus is kind of in control of, of that connection. So hypothalamus and controlling um, uh, homeostasis helps to control your body temperature. So it monitors body temperature and controls the set point to keep you around that 98.6 or wherever it is your normal temperature is. Um, regulates uh, hunger and thirst. So it tells you when you need to drink some water because maybe your blood's getting a little thick and you need a little bit more water. Um, tells you if you're hungry. Um, it helps um, with that internal clock by working with the, uh, with the epithalamus, with the pineal gland. All right. Um, so looking at that hypothalamus just a, a little bit more. So uh, I don't have a picture of it here, but Hanging off of the hypothalamus is a structure called the infundibulum. And the infundibulum is basically a little stalk, and that stalk connects the hypothalamus with the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland is considered the master gland of your endocrine system. So remember how I said that the hypothalamus kind of connects the nervous system and the endocrine system? This is how it does it. So through that infundibulum, the, the um, hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, gland are directly connected so that they can communicate and control communication throughout the rest of the body. All right, so a couple questions here. So the medulla, pons, and midbrain are all part of what structure? And where do the nerve tracks from the left and right sides of the body cross over before making their way up to the cerebrum? All right, so there's your answer. So those three structures, medulla oblongata, pons, and midbrain are all part of the brainstem. Um, the nerve tracts, the motor tracts, cross over at the decussation of, of the pyramids, which is in the medulla oblongata. Okay, now which part of the brain controls each of the following um, activities here? So what part of your brain has your cardiovascular center? What part of the brain controls posture, posture and balance? Uh, where is consciousness located? Where is your respiratory center? Um, your circadian rhythm, internal clock? Um, your relay center? What part of the brain controls emotions? That one's tricky, I didn't talk about it yet. Um, and then which one controls um, things like hunger, thirst, and body temperature? So think about it. All right, here's some answers for you. So, Cardiovascular center is located in the medulla oblongata, so that's controlling your heart rate uh, and blood pressure. Um, cerebellum is controlling your posture, equilibrium, and balance. Um, the cerebrum is where we find consciousness, so kind of higher level thinking, consciousness, and self-awareness is in the cerebrum. Um, the respiratory centers, you've got a couple um, main respiratory controls in the medulla, but then you also have secondary control in the pons. Um, your circadian rhythm or your, your daily diurnal clock is controlled by the pineal gland, which is the epi, in the epithalamus. Um, the relay center that's going to direct signals where they're going in the cerebrum is called the thalamus. Um, 
your limbic system is in control of your emotions. So a lot of emotion regulation happens or a lot of emotion and originates from the limbic system. Uh, regulation of that emotion happens somewhere else. Um, and then as far as controlling homeostasis, things like hunger, thirst, and temperature, that's going to be your hypothalamus. All right, so moving on to, to the cerebrum itself. So again, we mentioned that the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain. Um, so this it's all that kind of highly folded structure that you kind of picture as being your brain. So this whole kind of part in orange that they've got highlighted here in this picture is going to be um, the cerebrum. So this is where a lot of that higher level thinking comes in, a lot of your um, your ability to, to, to speak, your ability to understand, your ability to problem solve, all of that's coming from the cerebral cortex. So we're gonna talk about, and the cortex is just the highly folded outer portion of the cerebrum. All right, so we can divide the cerebrum into different lobes. Um, and the lobes of the cerebrum um, are basically just named after the bones that they sit underneath. So if you remember your, your bones of your skull, then this should be pretty simple. Right, so the, the frontal lobe of the cerebrum is right underneath the frontal bone. Then you've got the parietal off to the side here, temporal down by your ears, and then the occipital lobe in the back. All right, so as far as what these different lobes do for you, um, they definitely have different functions, and we localize these different functions in different places in the brain. Um, so starting with the, we'll start with the frontal lobe and talk about what's happening there. Um, so the frontal lobe up here, um, this prefrontal area, so the very, very front part of your brain, um, we consider that the part that's sort of in control of your higher level functioning, decision making, emotional control, emotional regulation. So um, the part of your brain that kind of, this is probably the last part of your brain to develop and really kind of keep you in control of your emotions and your behaviors. Um, which, you know, usually finishes developing around around your late 20 or maybe early 20s, I should say. Um, so a lot of higher level control and complex thinking executive function is happening in that frontal lobe. Um, the frontal lobe is separated from the parietal lobe by uh, a deep groove called the central sulcus. So a sulcus is just another name for like a groove or an indentation in the brain. So the central sulcus is what's separating here the frontal lobe from the parietal. Um, so everything before that is all frontal lobe, but I want to look at just this, this ridge here. This just kind of dark green colored ridge um, that we call the precentral gyrus. So precentral gyrus means a gyrus is just a lump in the brain, so one of those lumps. Um, a precentral means that it's it's before the central sulcus. So the precentral gyrus is the gyrus that comes before the central sulcus. Um, that's your primary motor area. So your primary motor area, meaning that's where you actively think about what muscles you want to move when you move your body around. All right. So and then we've got the central sulcus, and then right behind the central sulcus is another gyrus, um, and that's the postcentral gyrus. Um, the postcentral gyrus is your primary somatosensory area. So that means when sensory information is coming in, so things like, um, like feeling touch, pressure, vibration, temperature changes, pain, all that sensory information is coming up and it's going to be interpreted in your postcentral gyrus. So precentral is for motor, postcentral is for sensory, and you can imagine that these two work together. Right? As soon as I sense something, I might want to move to react to that sensation. Right? So that's the so postcentral gyrus is in the parietal lobe. Um, other areas that we should be familiar with down here. So as we move down into the occipital lobe, um, we get to your visual cortex. So your occipital lobe, which is way in the back of your brain, that's, um, that's where vision is processed. So all the sensory information that comes from your eyeballs. So I'm going to draw an eyeball in here. Your eyeballs would be way over here. Um, so that's a terrible eyeball, but <laughs> all that sensory information that's coming in from your eyeballs goes all the way to the back of the brain and is processed in the visual cortex. Um, and then looking over here at your temporal lobe, temporal lobe is going to be where we, we process um, some sensations associated with hearing, where a lot of memory is processed, um, uh, and we hear uh, understanding speech is going to be in there as well. 
All right, so let's let's kind of zoom in on those two gyruses or gyri, I think is the plural. So um, the pre-central and post-central gyrus, which which kind of straddle on either side of that central sulcus that separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So again, um, we've got the prima primary somatosensory area, which is in your post-central gyrus. That's going to be where we interpret um, a lot of the sensations from all over your body. So a lot of those somatic sensations that we talked about in the last video, um, so feeling things like um, touch and pressure and vibration, tickling, pain, and even proprioception, all of that is going to be um, processed in this primary somatosensory area. So if we take a kind of a cross section of the primary somatosensory area and we look at it um, from this angle, we can see, so if you look at this, it looks kind of like a weirdly um, proportioned human over here. We call that guy the sensory homunculus. So a sensory homunculus is basically looking at where the sensations for different areas in your body are processed in this particular um, somatosensory area in your brain. So for example, if we, we can look at these one by one and see, okay, sensations associated with my elbow occur right here on that portion of the brain. If I wanna see where sensations for my thumb are, they're gonna be way over here. So one thing to notice about this is some areas of the body have way more sensory information than others. So look how big the face is and look how big the hands are versus other parts of the body, right? So parts of like, say the back of your trunk, you really don't have as much sensory information. There aren't as many nerve endings there. So it doesn't take up as much space in this sensory homunculus um, as other parts like your face and your hands, which have a whole lot of sensory information. All right, so kind of similar to the fact that we had that uh, sensory homunculus, we've already got We've also got a motor homunculus. So, and this is going to map onto the primary motor cortex, which is in that precentral gyrus. So, again, this is where motor control of all these different parts of your body comes from. So, if I want to find out what part of my brain is in control of, of my hand muscles, well, then it's going to be right here. If I want to see what part of my brain is in control of my eyelid movement, that's going to be right there. So it's, it's the motion sensors associated with these particular areas of the body. All right, and a quick note on hemispheric lateralization. Um, so uh, all that means is that um, each hemisphere of your brain, so we separate your brain into the left and the right hemispheres. So each hemisphere of your brain is gonna be responsible for some different things. Um, there is overlap and the two hemispheres of the brain do talk to one another. Um, but but a lot of times there's a specialization on one side for certain things and on the other side for for other things. Um, so and this it's not the same in everybody. So a lot of times men tend to have more pr pronounced lateralization, which means they might control things more uh, acutely on one side versus the other, whereas females can can kind of control both more evenly. All right, so if you do have this lateralization, which we all do to some extent, um, the left hemisphere tends to be more important for things like reasoning, um, number skills, math, science, that gets mostly processed. So any kind of like heavy logic is gonna get processed on the left side, whereas the right hemisphere is more for kind of artistic expression, music, um, language, things like that are more uh, processed on the right hemisphere of the brain. And again, it's, it, 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 these things can switch, um, and, but, and we can have some people use both sides equally for both things, but for the most part, we do tend to notice these patterns. Okay, so how do the two hemispheres um, talk to one another? Um, they connect through a structure called the corpus callosum. So corpus callosum, let me highlight it here in yellow. So corpus callosum is this kind of C-shaped structure um, that's gonna be connecting the two hemispheres of the brain together. So this is where um, thick tracts, so remember tracts as being bundles of axons in the central nervous system, cross over to connect the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. So this is how you can control um, uh, all of these things at once so that your brain can interpret something um, with, with the left side of it and also be able to think about that on the right side of the brain as well. 
Okay. All right. So we've been talking, most of this conversation um, has been about uh, cerebral cortex, but also deeper in the cerebrum. So not at the cortex or the cortical outer part of the brain, but deeper in the cerebrum itself, uh, we get to um, some structures called the basal nuclei. So basal nuclei are uh, groups of cell bodies that are associated with um, suppressing unwanted movement. So they basically control movement um, in a way that is uh, kind of calming to keep you from reacting to things as strongly as maybe you would um, if, if these basal nuclei weren't functioning properly. So they keep, they keep unregulated movements from happening, right? Your brain's really complex. There might be a whole bunch of movements that your, your brain is firing around and maybe you want to shake and wiggle and can't sit still in your chair or you just want to jump up and run away because you hate listening to this lecture. Those kind of movements are regulated by the basal nuclei, right? So, um, and they mostly work by using the neurotransmitter dopamine. So that dopamine transmitter we talked about before. Um, when the basal nuclei are working properly and there's plenty of dopamine to go around, then we suppress those unwanted movements. Um, and we talked, we mentioned last time, I think that Parkinson's disease is um, lack of dopamine um, so that we start to get a whole lot more unwanted movements. All right, um, limbic system. So this is another part of your brain. Um, we kind of associate um, uh, parts of your uh, diencephalon and midbrain with the limbic system. Um, so specifically to a couple structures called um, the amygdala in the hippocampus are associated with your limbic system. These are for processing emotion. Um, so they, they include all of the basic kind of raw emotions um, are felt here. Um, and also your emotional memory is set here. So that when you remember things in the past that have emotions associated with them, that emotional memory is located in the, in the limbic system. So here's where we see the, the limbic system. So specifically the amygdala and hippocampus here, important for feeling those, feeling those feelings. Okay. A um, quick note on some medications that can alter the function of the brain. Um, so barbiturates are uh, medications that decrease your alertness um, and maybe make you sleepy. Um, so those are, they basically work by depressing the reticular activating system of your brainstem. So remember that that reticular activating system is in charge of controlling whether you're awake or asleep. Um, so if you, if you give it a whole bunch of barbiturates, it's going to put you to sleep. Um, amphetamines kind of do the opposite. Um, these work by stimulating your cerebrum. So that's going to make you much more alert because it's working on the cerebrum, which is that upper higher level thinking, um, keeping you alert and focused. Uh, and then anesthesia, anesthesia, different kinds of anesthesia work in different ways, but basically a lot of them alter your state of consciousness and put you into an, an unconscious state um, so that you don't form memories of what's happening to you while you're under that anesthesia. Okay, and then just a, a quick few disorders here. So coma uh, is, is when you're, you're, you've lost consciousness, right? So you don't have, uh, you shouldn't be forming memories in that state. So you're definitely impaired when you're in a coma. Um, aphasia is the inability to speak, all right? So a lot of this can happen because of damage to a particular area in the brain called Broca's area. So Broca's area is located in the frontal lobe, but kind of on the side of the frontal lobe. Broca's area, um, if, you, if you've done damage to it, you can understand language so you can hear it, but you're not gonna be able to form the words to respond, right? So in order to be able to have a conversation, you'll need to have Broca's area functional. Um, Polio is a viral infection of the, um, um, of the central nervous system. So it basically, it infects the spinal cord and can, can result in paralysis. Uh, and then CVA stands for cerebrovascular accident, which is basically um, a stroke. So if we have a, a disruption of blood flow to any part of the brain, um, then we're starving that part of the brain of oxygen. Uh, and if you starve it of oxygen, the tissue will start to die uh, and it won't be able to do its job anymore. All right, so just a few questions here. Uh, what part of the brain processes uh, sensory input and controls conscious movement? Uh, what is the corpus callosum? And what neurotransmitter is used by the cerebral cortex when controlling movement? 
All right, so there's your answer. The part of the brain that processes sensory input and controls conscious movements is your cerebrum. All right, so the cerebrum is where that post-central gyrus and pre-central gyrus are that are controlling sensory info and motor info. Um, the corpus callosum is the structure that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, and then the neurotransmitter that controls movement is dopamine and lack of that neurotransmitter leads to Parkinson's. All right, so I hope that helped uh, your understanding of the brain. Let me know if you have any questions.